Good, so I get started. So today um, I give a slightly unusual talk, which is a short history of data-driven dialogue systems in five acts, and then also discussing where do we go from here. Um, so as you can infer from the title, this is more of an overview talk um, to engage also critical discussion rather than, you know, presenting any papers in great detail as, if, as you would usually do in conference presentations. So, um, before I start, here are some of the people of my team who uh, contributed to this um, uh, presentation today. So, before I start, um, or like, as I've already mentioned, this is a slightly unusual talk about history. So, why, why history? Um, so, um, I really got the idea of this talk um, slight earlier this year when someone I followed on Twitter asked for references on the history of computational linguistics. And I started looking around for the area I'm more, most familiar with, which is conversational AI and natural language processing. And there are few resources, and I want to point out uh, some very nice chapter, uh, chapters in Mike McTeer's uh, recent textbooks, and also Ehud kindly uh, provided some um, thoughts on, on uh, more hist historical um, dimensions on, on his blog on NLG, which I can highly recommend, and I'm sure a lot of people already follow. Um, however, um, I get the impression that there's often very little awareness of pre-neural work in our rapidly growing community. Um, and this has disadvantages, so people start reinventing the, v the wheel, but also they're missing out. So they're missing out on some treasures, so on some hidden treasures which we used to work on in pre-neural work and maybe now are forgotten with people sort of focusing mostly on uh, modeling approaches and don't pay too much attention on other aspects which we used to work on. Finally, um, it's sort of, sort of an anniversary for me. I've started working on my first dialogue system 20 years ago and I was lucky that my career evolved as a parallel journey to towards data-driven dialogue systems. So it's a good time for me to, to reflect. And why five acts? So five acts are inspired by um, the dramatic structure as described by uh, Freitag. Uh, in 1900. So another fact um, about myself, I originally studied uh, literature and this is how you describe a drama, right? So there is an introduction of the topic, then there's a rise in action, there's some sort of climax which happens, then there's a return or fall, and finally there's the catastrophe. So it sounds like doom and gloom, however, if you flip this pyramid around, you get a comedy. So one of the questions I'm going to discuss today is whether we have a catastrophe or what it needs to take that we actually have an, a happy ending, right? So the, um, the five acts uh, correspond to different sort of eras in the field of data-driven dialogue systems. So we'll start out by talking about rule-based systems, so rules informed by data. The second act is then when really data-driven meant machine learning, which is reinforcement learning. Act number three are neural end-to-end -end systems. Um, act number four um, are using massively pre-trained systems, so I made that a different act. And then finally, act, um, so, so act number four is where we are at the moment. Um, and act number five is sort of the discussion of will we have a catastrophe and what does it take to have a happy ending in these five dramatic acts. And for each act I will discuss um, the data used, the models used, the evaluation and what I call the system design. So before I start I want to just very briefly remind you of the uh, anatomy of a dialogue system. So I'm sure that many of you will already know this, um, but just to start out with uh, establishing the basics. So we've got a user who says something, um, and this is a speech signal which first needs to be recognized. Um, 
and out of the speech recognition system we get an hypothesis so we can't be exactly sure what the user said and this hypothesis is then processed by the natural natural language understanding module so to make sense out of it all and part of NLU is for example domain identification user intent detection and slot filling when you have a typed dialogue system you have uh, text input straight into the NLU module. So then <clears throat> the output of NLU is a semantic frame, so some sort of description of what the user said. So in this case, it's an intent and entities as part of that intent, which we also refer to as a, as a dialogue act. And that then gets fed into the dialogue manager. So it's sort of like the brain of a system which decides what to do next. And part of the uh, tasks of the dialogue management is dialogue state tracking, so continuously updating um, the hypothesis of what the user might have said. This is especially relevant when it comes to speech recognition and then, then, and then deciding on the dialogue policy. So this is then what to output. And again, the output is in terms of this um, sort of abstract semantic representation in terms of intent entities or also dialogue act. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention the dialogue manager also often has access to a back end such a database or API or knowledge graphs. So then this output, um, the dialogue act needs to be realized into a text or translated into text and that's the job of the NLG module which I'm sure you all know um, and that then if you've got a text-based system goes straight to the user and if you've got a, a spoken dialogue system you will also have a text-to-speech synthesizer in between so I've mainly worked on the NLG and the dialogue management module so my very first system um, was a rule-based system. As I said, that's what used to be the state of the art in like the early 2000s, 1990s. And um, this is still very much used in a lot of commercial applications because it's very easy to control and quite easy to build for a specific, specific domain. So the way you build it is you basically write a lot of uh, rules, which you know you can represent as flowcharts, which you then implement um, into code. And the very one of the very first systems which I implemented was a talking washing machine as part of my uh, my gister, my MA uh, thesis, and we called her Hermine in German or Herman in English, and. It wasn't a very sophisticated system and it had a lot of problems, especially with speech recognition, which was a main problem these days. So speech recognition wasn't as good as today's speech recognition, which is mainly neural and trained on a lot of data. In those days, the main, well, it was, it was very, very bad. And the workaround we had for this very bad speech recognition was every time Hermine wouldn't understand what the user said, she would crack a joke. And the people loved it. So we exhibited uh, Hermine in, at Sebit, which was one of a major trade show in Germany. And the international press really latched on to that talking washing machine. There were uh, headlines such as, man, don't worry, now you can talk to your wash washing machine. And the Irish time put it very appropriately. Hermine understands a few hundred words and even has a basic sense of humor. And that really describes that system very well. It wasn't very sophisticated, but it was funny and people loved using it. So how did we build it? So some people might say it's rule-based, whereas the data here, so we still actually use data, but not for learning on, but to inform system design. So we had, um, user, uh, we had a user requirement analysis where we talk to potential users, so everybody who could potentially own a washing machine. And um, also, uh, often people did a corpus analysis. Uh, for example, I, um, for my master's dissertation, I looked into how people ask clarification questions, and this knowledge you would then take and implement into a system. 
models. So these were not machine learning models, but implemented models in terms of, um, for example, using voice XML, or in more academic cycles, you would use a um, technique called information state update approach, which was uh, basically a lot of uh, prolog rules painfully implemented. The evaluation, again, was different to what we do nowadays. We had structured interviews, so asking people about what they liked and what they didn't like when interacting with the uh, washing machine. So it was much more, uh, much more qualitative than quantitative. So system design in those days was engineering on the one hand, so you implemented your rules, but also a lot of HCI, so much more uh, quantitative approaches. Right. Um, if there are no questions, I will just continue. The second act is then reinforcement learning. So that was something which I then did for my PhD thesis. Um, and reinforcement learning, the idea is quite simple. It comes from uh, robotics. So you've got an agent which explores different actions in an uncertain environment. And it observes the impact of these actions in onto the environment and um, it observes the altered state of the environment and it also gets an associated reward to that altered state and based on this information it updates what we call a q function so this is some sort of value function over a policy pi which assigns um, a value to each state and action pair and then you train this on a lot of data in order to get estimates how good um, an action in a certain context is. So the data um, which we used, we mainly used two types of data. One was very much user-centric, so knowing what the user would do. And the interesting bit is that these data sets were gathered in the wild. So, for example, there's the communicator corpus where real users dial up existing systems. And then there's also let, the let's go um, corpus, which is uh, people, real people <laughs> in Pittsburgh calling a bus information system on their phone. These days, they weren't, they weren't smartphones, uh, weren't that popular. And then the other type of data was um, that we actually looked into what uh, the wizard did. So here we put a human in the place of a system in order to see what sort of strategy, what sort of policy a human would deploy instead uh, in, in, in place of a system. And, um, and here we often took that as a sort of initial policy to initiate our uh, reinforcement learning agent. So the models use the Markov decision processes, sometimes also partially observable Markov decision processes. So these were mainly then used to um, account for the uncertainty you get from speech recognition. The evaluation function, uh, sorry, the evaluation was done again in two ways. So, and this is where really the automatic metrics came in. So here we started to not just look into user questionnaires, but we also looked into some objective numbers, right? And here we looked at whether reward functions would go up or down. And in addition to that, if you wanted to publish, you also had to have a user evaluation. And the nice thing back in these days was that we actually had a standardized questionnaire called DATE, which we all used. So the system design in those days was basically um, feature engineering. Um, so this was to um, um, a large extent that you had to manually specify what's in the state space, and you also had to manually specify your reward function. And then also wrangling small data sets. So a lot of this learning was actually done on this dialog act level. So you had to have data sets which were annotated with dialog acts, which is really expensive to get. So during my PhD thesis, I mainly wrangled very small data sets, a couple of hundred examples. So the um, workaround we came up with was that we actually simulated environments. So the idea is that your system isn't good enough yet to test it with real users. So we bootstrap um, 
simulated users from small annotated data sets and then we add sort of some smoothing and some noise to it to make it um, you know to make the user simulation useful to explore a larger state action space um, so again so we basically had a lot of lot of simulated interactions instead of user uh, scores, we got reward functions, and some people also used error models in order to simulate speech recognition error. And the idea was that you then just would be able to keep this policy learning. So you would start it out in a simulated environment, and once it was good enough according to reward function, you could release it to real users and it would keep on learning in the wild. So this all sounds theoretically very attractive. Um, however, there are a couple of drawbacks of reinforcement learning for dialogue systems. So first of all, it's very data hungry. Um, as I mentioned, we sort of introduced the simulated users. In my mind, simulated users don't really solve the problem. They just shift the problem. So now we've got the, pro instead of building systems, we build simulated users, which come with the same problems such as how do you evaluate the simulated user and the learned policy is only as good as your simulated user is. Then I already mentioned there's the manual specification of the state space and the reward function. People also refer to that as the black art of reinforcement learning and I can confirm I spent a couple of months during my PhD sweating because my system just wouldn't learn anything useful and I had some somehow misfactorized my state space. And as soon as I corrected that, it just yeah, went and learned the right thing. But it was very pain, painful to specify it in a way that it can actually learn. Uh, apologies. Let me just hang up. Um, and then finally, there's also a mismatch between modules. So as I mentioned, there's this modular approach, which, you know, treats, for example, dialogue management and uh, NLG as two separate modules. So if you optimize those separately and you want to stick them back together, that doesn't work very well. Um, so again, that's something we learned the hard way. We had a big European project between um, our group doing the, uh, the the dialogue, no, our group doing the NLG and Cambridge doing the dialogue management and it just didn't work when you stick, stuck it back together. So, <clears throat> as you can imagine, the next act then somehow solved hey, some Karina? of these problems. Oh yeah, so, so before, that's, you go on, before you go on to act three, mm -hmm. we had a question for act two from Francois Forte saying, isn't the lack of data still a problem for any new application that didn't exist before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that exactly that doesn't go away the 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 um, um, the lack of data. Obviously, nowadays we we have pre-trained models and um, have uh, you know we can fine tune. But in those days, we the the sort of workaround we had was the the Wizard of Oz strategy. So we called it a chicken and egg problem saying, okay, we can't have any data unless we've got a system, right? And if we build a system, we already need to know something about, you know, the action space we want to deploy. So this is exactly why we had those wizards. So these humans pretending to be the system. So we basically had a whole setup where you had a human and um, an interface where people would talk to a system not knowing that they would talk to a human. And then we used that sort of small data set to then bootstrap um, you know, the action space and also bootstrap that simulated environment. But you, yeah, that was the, the first step you had to have in domain data, that's true. Was that, did that's that answer the question? Thank you, Verena. It was just a, a general remark, not only for this. Uh, didn't want you to interrupt your. No, it was a good, good uh, place to interrupt. Okay, good. Thanks for the okay. question. Okay, thanks very much. I guess carry on now. Let's do Act Three. <laughs> okay, so Act Three um, solves some of these problems, as I already mentioned. So by, so th for example, the mismatch between modules uh, was solved by 
having an end-to-end -end architecture, right? Instead of having these different modules for dialogue management and natural language generation, you now all do it in and natural language understanding. You all now do it in one go. So that's what we call end-to-end. -end. So we basically have an encoder decoder architecture where we encode whatever the user says and then we decode it into the system um, response so we treat it similar to a machine translation problem where you know the user utterance is one language and we translate it to um, a system response and in those days these uh, encoder decoder architectures were mainly LSTM based with attention um, and nowadays it would be transformers. So again, we have two types of data here. So one type of data is highly curated. Um, so for example, we've got data from movies such as open subtitles or system support such as the Ubuntu corpus and also the E2E challenge, which I will come back to later. And then we have some data from gathered in the wild, such as uh, Reddit and Twitter, which you can argue are somehow similar to dialogue, but also different. Then, as I mentioned, the model, we've got generative encoder-decoder architecture, also called sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. And for uh, some domains you also have discriminative models. So these are re-ranking models where you've got, let's say, a limited number of possible replies and you just learn to re-rank to the right reply in the right context. The evaluation is mainly reference-based, so you've got basically a human ground truth and then you measure the overlap using things like Blue or more recent extensions to Blue. And then, yeah, system design, you might argue that the human designer is mainly responsible to do the hyperparameter tuning. So one example for these end-to-end -end systems is data-to-text, in this case um, for task-based dialogue systems where we want to translate um, a meaning representation or a dialogue act or some sort of structured text representation into a well-formed sentence or well-formed utterance. And in the good old days, before, not before uh, neural models, we had to first establish some alignment between the input and the output. And this alignment had to be learned and also this from annotated data. So again, this was very costly to do and it was very hard to crowdsource this type of alignment. So then in about 2015, 2016, as I mentioned, people introduced the sequence-to-sequence -sequence models with attention. So this is an example um, from my colleague Andre Dushek called TGen, which was one of the uh, earliest systems um, doing this. So when these systems started to come out, we were very interested in establishing how well they would actually work. And by that time, they were only deployed on very simple data sets. So it was all about restaurant booking, but the formulation, the linguistic realization was very formulaic. And a lot of people said, well, my, my template-based system can also do that, right? So we thought, what if we try to model um, utterances of a higher linguistic complexity. And uh, we gathered such a data set again in the restaurant domain um, by showing crowd workers a pictorial representation of the underlying uh, data structure. So we tried not to prime them using these sort of formulaic um, uh, uh, phrases. And indeed they came up with some much more um, creative ways to describe the data. And we gathered about 50k of these uh, realizations and then we released it as a shared task which we called the end-to-end -end NLG task. And we had about 17 participants, 62 system submissions as far as I remember. And this data set is still used as a, as a benchmark um, these days. So one of the main outcomes of uh, this study was that we found that the sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence models uh, had a couple of problems. And in particular, they were not consistent with the input. So sequence-to-sequence -sequence models are displayed in purple on the slide. The input is in the first row of the table. 
in particular we found that they tend to hallucinate so here they just add a low price range even though price wasn't specified in the input they substitute values so here a coffee shop is turned into a pub and they often forget to mention um, slot types and values so this is obviously a matter uh, if, well, this is obviously problematic when you deploy uh, systems with real users or real customers they don't behave as expected and this is where customers and companies you lose trust in your system they won't deploy it and they won't use it so what can we do about it so before we know what to do about it maybe we need to ask why it happens and here people have different answers so some people say it's the model and this is what we call exposure bias in neural energy so it basically means that there's a mismatch or this discrepancy between the training phase and the testing phase so during testing we use um, we use the ground truth as a context as a previous context when predicting the next item so this is what we call teacher forcing however at test time we use the noisy generated labels and this is especially problematic for autoregressive models as mostly used these days for generation other people uh, including uh, my group uh, also says it's not only the model it's also the noise and here we looked into the E2E data which was as I mentioned crowdsourced and had some noise in it despite our best efforts and we sort of semi-automatically cleaned the data um, to um, and we showed that by this cleaning process we were able to improve the semantic correctness by an impressive amount so meaning less omissions less substitutions uh, and, and less hallucinations there are recent results which also suggest that maybe not enough data is the problem so for example by pre-training you can also uh, minimize uh, hallucinations so what to do about it well there are many possible answers one possible answer is to reintroduce sentence planning so this was the topic of an ACL paper uh, published this year by my student Shino Su which is sort of uh, ironic because that's what we were trying to get rid of in the first place this modular architecture however this time we are not doing it modularized but we're doing it end-to-end -end. so um, we basically model these two uh, planning phases so we've got an ordering phase and an aggregation phase as part of sentence planning and we model them jointly by using an HMM and then using um, transformers for emission and we show that it helps by using sentence planning we can um, improve the correctness of the model we also so how do we get these alignments then so we here we use a trick we use semantic role labeling to create these initial alignments and we show by doing that we can increase the robustness to noise so we show that on the cleaned and the noisy version of the end-to-end -end data so I'm not going into the details here but if you're at ACL please stop by at uh, Shino's poster right um, any questions before I go to the uh, to, to act four uh, no, um, carry on. Okay, cool. So the current act is where we are now. I probably don't have to tell you much about it. We've got massively pre-trained models, mostly privately owned. Um, we take all the data we can get from public sources, from social media, Reddit. We've got multi-layer transformers. Evaluation is interesting. Um, so a lot of the these big models are evaluated according to their how human they are. And this is using reference-based metrics, but also using human evaluations where they ask specifically about the humanness of a system. And then, yeah, system design, what you need to do when you build such a system is mainly knowing how to use GPUs and hugging face libraries, which is a great resource, by the way. So as a brief example is uh, I want to briefly tell you about the system we built for the Amazon Alexa challenge as Ehud already mentioned my team entered this challenge we entered it twice 
Um, we ended up on third place twice. Uh, we didn't enter a fourth time. It's a lot of effort, but it was also a very interesting experience. Um, and I want to briefly share with you some of the insights here. So when we first built our system, which we called Alana, um, which is now also the name of our company, is we train it on all the data we could possibly get. And then we, uh, you know, tuned our hyperparameters and the results were mixed. Uh, first of all, a lot of boring output. So the system would say yes, no, I don't know. So this has partly to do with this exposure bias in NLG. They settle on these very short, ut frequent utterances in the data. And people have addressed this problem by doing some clever re-ranking or decoding uh, mechanisms. But what we also found, which in my mind was even more concerning, was if the system wasn't boring, it was very inappropriate. So what do I mean by that? So um, this is um, a, uh, some examples, which we also discussed in a recent paper, um, appeared on Archive, I think, two days ago with Emily Dynan, where we look into different, what we call safety uh, issues for these conversational systems. And the first safety issue is these systems using inappropriate language. So the first example is from Microsoft Tay. You might have heard of it. That was a chatbot uh, released on Twitter, which learned from live user interaction. And obviously, it was very quickly hacked and said all sorts of outrageous things. The second examples are from our early version of our Alana system. Um, it liked to say, you will die, which was a short, frequent utterance as it found in the movies. And at Christmas time, it read out a headline which said, Santa is dead, which is especially problematic for children. So as you can see, it's very user group specific, what we mean by inappropriate. Another problem is the system is always very ready to agree with whatever you say. And we call this the ELISA effect. Um, and this is obviously problematic if it agrees to highly inappropriate statements which reinforce um, hate speech or uh, um, stereotypes towards protected subgroups, as in this example here. And then finally, we've got what we call the unsafe counsel or the imposter effect. So here the user asks a genuine question to the system. Um, it asks for help or advice. Oh, sorry, this user asks for help and advice and the system basically just gives um, an answer without really knowing what it what it says um, and in this example so this can be uh, you know health related or mental health related questions but also questions for example about um, financial advice so the last example is interesting because the from a dialogue perspective the output is actually really quite good but obviously Amazon wasn't happy and it actually uh, threatened us to take us offline un until we can't co until we can control our system, and this is when we decided to move away from a purely data-driven uh, architecture. So, <clears throat> how can we fix this? So, one initial idea which we had is that okay, what if we just learn from clean data? So, we got such a data set from an industrial partner of ours. Um, and what we found is that indeed when we use clean data, so data with no mention of death or inappropriate language, swear words and so on, that can actually fix what we call the Tay effect, but it can't fix the other two effects. So it would still encourage the user uh, to say more or agree with inappropriate statements. So that's actually a, a quote which uh, really happened in our system. So again how to fix it so one idea which we have how to fix it is actually move away from systems being just sort of stochastic parrots but systems actually taking initiatives so in dialogue systems we talk about mixed initiatives so it's not only the user which takes initiatives or the system but both should actually be able to introduce new topics and steer the conversation at the moment, it's mainly the, the user in 
um, data driven in these end to end systems, which sort of steers the conversation towards new topics. And the system sort of always sort of nods along. Um, so in, in this paper, which again is going to be presented at ACL, um, here we, we use knowledge graphs to introduce new and relevant topics. And again, I'm not going to go into the details, but please come and see uh, Karen's poster. So where do we go from here? Um, that's now act number five. Um, is it a cat catastrophe or is it a happy ending? So let me briefly talk you through the different stages so far. So we started out by data-informed rules. Then the rise was reinforcement learning. Everybody got very excited. The climax was really, in my mind, end-to-end -end neural models. A lot of people joined our community. The return or fall, I think, started to happen with the uh, famous stochastic parrot paper by Emily Bender and colleagues. And now we're at the point where we need to ask ourselves, can we flip this around to be a happy ending? So what needs to happen? What, what are we going to address first? So some people say um, it's the data. So um, that's the stochastic parrot paper makes this point. Also, there's a very nice paper by Anna Rogers at ACL this year, which also makes this point. Some people say it's the model. So again, uh, a paper by Emily Bender last year, ACL, uh, said that um, there is a that these models basically only learn form and not meaning. And she introduced, or they uh, introduced the um, the octopus test, which is similar to the Chinese room argument, like, can we actually really understand language? Some people also say um, maybe it's the evaluation which is to blame. So by using things as such as bird score, we actually encourage the models to very closely mimic the data. However, in some cases, we actually do not want to mimic the data. And then finally, maybe it's also the design of these models which encourage bad behavior. So this is a point which myself and uh, my group uh, published a couple of papers on um, this aspect, um, which in my mind is largely underexplored, and I will spend a couple of minutes uh, briefly advertising um, this aspect, so the design aspect. Um, so, as you might have noticed, a lot of these uh, conversational systems, at least the big commercial ones, are usually uh, women. And um, this was also pointed out by a recent report by UNESCO entitled I'd Blush If I Could. And they make the point that by using uh, female voices, we reinforce uh, gender stereotypes especially since these systems are very subservient and they also res don't respond well to abuse. So when you look into um, the um, uh, uh, sort of public um, perception of these systems, this also gets reinforced by uh, movies and adverts which present these systems as um, uh, sort of sexy female voices and avatars. So some of you might say, well, why do we care? These systems are actually not sentient, so if they get abused, they're not going to get hurt, right? So uh, we further explored this argument and we looked into the type of abuse we get. And um, first of all, we confirmed that there's quite a high level of abuse. So some people report up to 30% of customer interactions um, are abusive. And then we looked into the type of abuse and we can indeed confirm that it's mainly uh, abuse which is directed at the female character of these systems. So this, these distributions are very different from the type of abuse you, for example, find on, on Twitter which is much more um, hate speech, meaning, um, for example, racism. But this is um, abuse which is primarily sexism or sexual harassment directed at the character, meaning the, the uh, artificial uh, woman, artificial persona. 
So we also analyzed how these systems then react to the type of, to the abuse they get. And we had a couple of uh, baselines. So we had um, an adult only baseline, which means that we took um, systems which were specifically designed to be more encouraging. So bots which are only available on certain sites, um, not, uh, not available for children. And as expected, these sort of sex bots were more uh, flirtatious when you um, called them certain names, but they would also retaliate the insult and actually chastise the user. We also looked at data-driven systems, and as expected, they said a lot of nonsense, but they could also be interpreted as being actually quite flirtatious. And they were also swearing back. So if they saw a uh, swear word in the input, they would also be more likely to actually generate the swear word in the output. And then finally, commercial systems tended to um, avoid answering at all. Um, so this type of research also has an impact, I'm happy to say. So if you compare the answers from 2017, so pre the UNESCO report and pre our uh, study, they are very different to nowadays, uh, 2020. So especially the famous I'd blush if I could is now replaced with uh, I, won't, I won't respond to that. So <clears throat> you might also say that in addition to sort of just reacting to abuse, we might want to prevent abuse by designing better personas. So maybe personas which are not necessarily female and anthropomorphized. And that was something which we uh, looked into in a recent study, which is going to be published at the ACL workshop this year, where we compared user perceptions and the claims made by the systems and by the corporations. So. The corporations, when you read their uh, blog posts, they say our systems are not gendered, our systems are not ant anthropomorphized. And when you ask um, Google Assistant, Alexa and Siri, are you, what's your gender? They will deny having a gender, um, like cacti or species of fish, for example. Um, however, when you look into the perceptions of users, and we did that by uh, analyzing reviews and online discussions uh, uh, from Amazon and Google Play and Reddit, and we looked at the uh, pronouns people used. So we used Spacey for pronoun resolution, and we found that Alexa and Siri are primarily referred to as female. Um, followed by, sorry, whereas Google Assistant is primarily uh, referred to as it. And this might maybe indicate that um, the name you give your system is more important than the voice. Because actually Siri nowadays forces you to make a choice between a male and a female voice, um, whereas, um, where, but it's still uh, referred to as, uh, as a woman. Similar to the question, are you human, um, Google is quite choky about it, um, Alexa is quite poetic, it's like the Aurora Borealis, and Siri is quite sort of straightforward saying, I am a robot, I'm software, nothing human-like. However, again, <laughs> there's a however, uh, when you look into um, how, when you ask the system about human properties, so for example, what's your hobby, what's your favorite color, what do you like to eat, uh, we see a different picture. So we took the prompts from Persona Chat, so that's just all about, you know, people chatting about sort of personal traits, personal likes, personal dislikes. And we um, then annotate the system responses according to a humanness score. And this is like having human emotions, for example, I like, I love, I hate, and engaging in human activities such as eating and sleeping. And again, we found that um, especially Google Assistant has a very high humanness score or a very high score in being anthropomorphic in these answers, whereas a Siri <coughs> excuse me, has a very low score here. Uh, sorry, where is, uh, sorry, but this is, no, what I mean is that 
uh, it has an inverse relationship. Yeah, Siri has a very low score, but it has an inverse relationship to the uh, no answer. So Siri just can't handle a lot of these answers. And maybe that's why it has such a low humanness score. So <clears throat> to conclude, um, so I've briefly talked about the history of data-driven system. I've talked about data informed by rules, then reinforcement learning, then end-to-end -end neural learning, and then pre-training on large data sets. Um, what do we need to get an happy ending? So first of all, I think there needs to be trust. These systems need to work as expected. So no hallucinations, no substitutions. They need to be safe, so they need to reduce or don't cause any harm. And they need to be bias-free, so they don't shouldn't reinforce uh, negative stereotypes. And to conclude, I want to put a thought out there. Maybe design is actually uh, important here. So this is an often overlooked aspect. So maybe we should actually look more into HCI and less into data. And this also relates to a lot of efforts of how people now evaluate these systems. I think people in the HCI community are much more thorough when it comes to experimental setup and um, evaluation. Um, so by, by this thought, I want to conclude my talk and um, I will uh, now end the show so I can actually uh, see you guys.